Um, and this was last, uh, and you can look, you can look up their reports. It's a report on, uh, on civilian security in Afghanistan submitted in April and then again in November. And you can see in April the information on the political situation in Afghanistan is in there. It shows how many districts are in support of the government, how many are neutral, how many are in support of the Taliban, et cetera. This time around, that information was not there. Okay? So, so it, it, it's a counterproductive and failing strategy. And not just in Afghanistan. It's counterproductive and failing in Pakistan. Okay? In 2001, the Pakistanis had two insurgencies going on in their country. Neither of which was happening in the Pashtun tribal areas. Okay? In 2001, the Pakistani Taliban didn't exist. The Pakistani Taliban didn't exist until, really, I mean, there are extreme groups there and everything else, but you're going to find extreme groups anywhere in the world. Right? Pakistani Taliban didn't exist until the Pakistani army went into those Pashtun tribal areas, and we started sending drones into those areas as well. Okay, so what we see it's not just destabilizing Afghanistan, it's destabilizing Pakistan. It's not getting us what we want or what we need in that region. And it's been going on for five years now. So it, again, it's, it's, it's not just failing, but it's counterproductive. The, uh, the fourth reason is it distracts us from our foreign policy goals and objectives. Right now we're flat-footed. If North Korea attacks South Korea, we commit, can't commit the troops, we can't commit the aircraft, we can't commit uh, um, the resources that we should be able to defend South Korea like we could have, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Okay, we're flat-footed. Um, we have a thousand diplomats and other civilians working in Afghanistan. A thousand diplomats and civilians who are not working in South America or in East Asia or in other parts of the world. The um, um, Afghanistan, uh, I have a friend of mine who had met the Chinese Minister of Planning um, uh, a couple years ago, and he said, what's China's strategy for engaging with the U.S.? And he says, China's strategy for, and this is honestly a Chinese minister said this, China's strategy for engaging with the U.S. is to keep the U.S. mired in Middle Eastern conflicts that really don't matter. Okay? <laughs> keep them mired in a landlocked country with a GDP of $14 billion. Met with um, uh, Lee Hamilton, uh, the former congressman from Indiana back in the fall, and Mr. Hamilton said, uh, you know, I, and, and I, I, this is one of the reasons why I should always write stuff down, because I can't remember which way it went. I can't remember, even remember if it was our ambassador to Chile or the Chilean ambassador to the U.S. who said this to, to Mr. Hamilton. But he said, where are you guys? Where's the U.S. government in South America right now? Your corporations are here, but we don't see the U.S. government here. The Chinese government's here. Other nations are here. So when we're looking for a reliable, credible partner to work with in the future, you guys aren't around. Okay, so it distracts us from other things that are more pressing, more important to us. Plus it plays into, you know, again, go, what does China, China wants to do? Hey, get, stay in Afghanistan, stay in Iraq. Russians feel the same way, okay? Mm -hmm. And it also goes right into Al-Qaeda's propaganda pitch. It goes right into their playbook. You know, the, their thing is that, hey, this is an extension of the Crusades. We are defending the Muslim world against Western incursion. This goes, we're occupying two Muslim countries. goes right into their playbook. So we see it as distracting us from our foreign policy goals in other areas and, and basically, um, helping either our competitors or our adversaries in terms of their goals or, or their, their propaganda. And finally, the fifth one is just simply, um, there's a moral aspect for this, okay? Um, the Karzai government is the very definition of a kleptocracy. Uh, I mean, you look up kleptocracy in the dictionary and there's Karzai and his buddies, okay? The senior leaders of Karzai's government are drug lords and war criminals. <laughs> Simple. I mean, I can't say anything more than that. That's what they are. Uh, anyone who has this idea that they are somehow... Um, legitimate. Well, legitimate, yeah, first of all, that's another thing. That's, and that, you can get, we can get into whole conversations. Anyone here is, we can get into to political science conversations about dynastic and, and, and religious and, and legal uh, legitimacy and how they fail on... Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, we can get into that if you want to talk about that. But, but it, it's, it, if you think that they're paradigms of virtue, that they're paradigms of a champions of human rights, they're champions of, of, of progressive values or secularism or anything like that, or, or that they are real believers in democracy, that these are the, 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 the founding fathers with brown skin, um, you're completely wrong, okay? These guys are as dirty, as corrupt, and have as much blood in their hands as anyone else does. Um, so the question for us becomes then, hey, you know, if we, you know, say 15 or 20 years from now, and it, and it, it won't be that quick, because it took us 
what, 50, 60 years to build a memorial to World War II. So, I mean, so, but at some point, I do hope we have a memorial for Iraq and Afghanistan. And it'll probably look like the Vietnam Memorial in some way, and have a list of names. And actually, you know, it's interesting, I walked in on, on the right upstairs, when you come in, there's a plaque for Maplewood's uh, uh, dead in, in various wars, uh, going up to the Vietnamese War, uh, the Vietnam War. Um, it, but yeah, I mean, when you were looking at this, 15 or 20 years from now, we're looking at this wall, and we see these names, and there's names I'll recognize, and many of you might re may recognize names as well. What are we gonna say about it? Are we gonna say it was right that these young men and women gave up their lives, that their families were shattered forever to prop up the Karzai government? So there's a moral aspect to this. Uh, and that's also then that transcends into our moral authority uh, around the world, uh, whether or not we're credible, whether or not we're reliable, et cetera. So those are the five things that unite us, uh, basically, in our opposition to our current policy, as well as to uh, uh, why we think it's in the best interest of the United States to shift our policy and to go <clears throat> into some form of uh, engagement with Afghanistan and engagement with Afghanistan's neighbors that's beneficial, not just for us, but for the region. Because ultimately what the United States is looking for in that part of the world is stability. Um, that's ultimately what is, is in our best interest, just happens that it's also in Afghanistan and other folks' interests as well. So I'll, I'll run real quick through our recommendations because I want to get into the political aspect of this and then open up for questions. We have, we have just about, what, 50 minutes left or so? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, the, first, the first one, that, and we spoke about this before, so I'm not going to belabor it. And again, our report's over there. You can look it up online. Um, is, you know, emphasize uh, political reconciliation. Emphasize political uh, settlement. Uh, emphasize deal making, um, reduce the violence, okay, stop the violence, and that's stop the violence. Unfortunately, I feel with Afghanistan, much like Iraq, you're, that those countries won't have peace for at least a generation, but they might have a chance at stability, okay? So do those things necessary to bring about stable political order at local and national levels to bring down the violence and give the country a chance to develop. Okay, the second one is to scale back our military presence there, withdraw our troops out of the south. I would call for an immediate ceasefire um, and get our troops out of southern eastern Afghanistan, get them out of those valleys where the Taliban are receiving support just because we're there. I mean, that, that was one of my major things that, that hit me the hardest was this realization that, hey, our kids who are dying over there, they're dying because they're fighting farmers who don't want them in their valley. It's that simple. It's got nothing to do with 9-11. You know, unfortunately, we've had a, a narrative under both administrations that if we're not in Afghanistan, the Empire State Building is next. Okay, I mean, and that's been a, a legitimate narrative used by both administrations. And, and, it, and it's in at nine and a half years of this, you know, I mean, that, that's the question that comes up. But won't we get attacked right away? No, the, the, I mean, the, the guys we're fighting are subsistence farmers who are involved in a generations-long conflict that has ethnic reasons behind it, regional reasons behind it. Um, a lot of it is Hatfield and McCoy type stuff. Okay, I mean these are our, our young kids, our young American, our young American guys and, and gals are stuck in the middle of this. Okay, so we go there, we we we, we uh, put the Hatfields in power, we make them rich. Okay, and then we uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, so we put them in power, we make them rich, and so the McCoys have no choice but to turn to the Taliban. Okay, and our kids are stuck in the middle of it. Okay, and it's got nothing to do with legitimate U.S. national security interests. We don't say completely withdraw. Um, we bring it down to uh, again. We we, we said thirty thousand by twenty twelve. That was our recommendation last year. So you got to push that to the right of it. But the idea being that you can't completely withdraw because we do see public opinion polls that say, hey, sixty percent of Afghans uh, want us in the country, want the coalition there. I agree that that's most likely completely true. Plus or minus maybe five percent somewhere. Um, but there's 40% that are violently opposed to our presence. 